Welcome to another podcast of Mad in Love. If you're new here, I'm Dr. David Hawkins from the Marriage Recovery Center. Today we have a special guest and a good friend, Dr. David Clark. He's here to discuss his new book, Adult Children Who Break Your Heart, which I'm excited to talk about. Adult Children Who Break Your Heart. Like that's like in the United States, that's like 100 million people. or That's a lot, a lot of folks who have adult grown children. You know, we're probably talking to a 50-year-old person right now, maybe a 60-year-old person, someone who's mature enough that their adult children have already left the home, but there's still repercussions. There's wounds that are still going on. So talk to us a little bit about the book, and then I'm, I've got a lot more questions for you about the book. What, what, why'd you write this book? Well, it, it's for the reason you just stated, David. There are literally millions of parents in this situation. We see the rise of narcissism and, and prodigalism, which is what I call it, is a form of that. It's everywhere. And parents are just thinking, of course, with the breakdown of the society, all the things happening, God out of the schools, God out of our whole lives. This is what we get. And we're seeing a tremendous upswing. So after fielding calls and doing phone advice sessions, I thought, you know what? I need to write a book with a plan of action, one that I'm used to following, that at least gives you a chance to bring that prodigal back to God. And for the parent, we'll get into this too, but for this, it's also as much as for the parents as it is for the child. That kid may never come back. I, I don't know. You're going to do your best. But parents have to release the burden, forgive themselves, and kind of move on with their lives and not allow that kid to destroy them, which I've seen plenty of times. So why are there so many prodigals then, Dr. Clark? Why, why, in your estimation, why is it happening uh, at an epidemic pace? I think, I think these are the factors. As I said before, we have, we have the rise of narcissism, as you know very well. Being an expert, it is below, it we're just off the charts. The amount of selfishness. Now, we're all selfish people, but in this American culture especially, it is all about me. Me, 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 me. And so we see the breakdown of the family, kids being spoiled, participation trophies, social media is not helping. Everything I do has tremendous meaning. I had a cheeseburger today at lunch, and I'm going to show the entire <laughs> world what that was like. It's just like, oh. and of course, we read divine sin. There's no sin anymore. There is no sin in America of any type. You can do whatever you want. Uh, other than maybe kill someone, and even then you're not going to get much of a consequence in some of these crazy cities, but I, I can do whatever I want, and, and, I ha and, and it has to be okay. There are no constraints. Uh, even 10, 15 years ago, we had some kind of a semblance of, of constraint, or no, I wouldn't do that, or I think that's not a good idea. That's gone now. If you stand against sin, they'll try to destroy you. So that breeds narcissism, which breeds prodigalism. How can parents deal effectively with their guilt, Dr. Clark. That seems like a huge, huge issue. And I'm sure you have a, you must have a treatment protocol or a, a certain way of talking to parents about, about their guilt. What, oh, yeah. what needs to happen there? I always have a plan. Dr. Clark has a plan. Hopefully it's a good plan. <laughs> but uh, guilt is a universal, it's almost universal for parents. As we talked about before, if your child messes up, you're thinking, what, the first thing, what did I do? What did I do wrong? And you can always look back and see, man, because you're searching for answers and there aren't any obvious answers. Well, I wasn't home as much. I was building my career. I, I was critical here. I, I think I favored that child. You're coming up with all kinds of you have to let that go because, as I said, of course, it destroys you. It's not even accurate most of the time. And the prodigal know they smell your guilt and they know it's there and they'll just beat you over the head with it. So we have to take that out of their hands. So honestly, I'll have parents verbalize with each other, with the Lord, with the, with the counselor, with, the, with, the, with a close friend. They verbalize all the mistakes they can possibly think of as parents. They don't make anything up. But a searching inventory of, okay, here's, I think, I, this is all we can think of we did wrong. And then I actually have them write a very detailed letter to the prodigal. They don't send that until later in the program. But it's written out, it's read to God, read to their spouse, read to their therapist, read to their, their best friend. And so we're cleaning out. And of course, we're if God forgives you from something, you are forgiven. Nobody else has to do that. They're going to yeah. be asking for the prodigal's forgiveness as part of the process. But if, if God forgives me, and I, but I've done the psychological work of admitting it and expressing it and owning it, 
I'm done. I'm, that is a huge step forward. Most parents don't do that because it's a, a way of, the, of some kind of control. They're thinking if I can, if I can actually figure out what I did wrong, then it's bad thinking. But somehow, and if I admit that, or somehow if I make some changes, then, then I can maybe help the prodigal. This got nothing to do with it. It, it doesn't. Prodigal is going to do whatever he wants or she wants to do, no matter what you do. So you have to let that guilt go. And I, I've got a plan for that. I've seen it work many times. Yeah. So I want to see if I get this. So <clears throat> you have them really take uh, an accurate view of let, let's go ahead. Let's do it. Let's talk about everything you've done wrong. Let's get it out onto the table and let's look at it maybe with a, uh, a set of fresh objective, more objective eyes rather than just this uh, overwhelming feeling of guilt that is uh, kind of vague and you, you want to get them to take a, an accurate assessment. And if they, and, and maybe, well, not maybe, they will uncover mistakes that they've made. And you, you provide a supportive atmosphere for talking about that. Yes, you're not perfect. Yes, you've made this mistake and that mistake. But uncoupling it from the prodigal, that didn't cause. Do, do you I, take that step too, Dr. Clark? I absolutely do. We are not going to give the, it's not true anyway. We're not going to give the prodigal that kind of an advantage. Because they're tying it together. Oh, absolutely. If they're having problems or their life's falling apart, which it will, typically, then they, they, they're going to tie it back to you. We are severing that connection. Even if I made these mistakes, and they were bad mistakes. Most cases, they aren't. But if they were even, yeah, I'm forgiving, I'm sorry. And you can ask the prodigal, yeah, uh, and I'll even help pay maybe. If you want to work through those issues, hey, you can choose to do that. But yeah, we are not having any connection between the two. Because if we allow that connection, you remain in horrible guilt and shame. The prodigal feeds on that, and they don't change. We are taking that away from them in a process. Yeah. Say just a little bit more about that, Dr. Clark, that, that you're, <clears throat> you're uncoupling. There, there's not a, a, yes, I made that mistake, and so therefore I caused their, would you call it prodig prodigalism? Prodigalism. That, this is my own word, a prodigalism. <laughs> Prodigalism. Okay, so you're uncoupling. <laughs> you're uncoupling. No, no. There's there's some responsibility. You you. I mean, you made some mistakes, and you need to take ownership of that. But that doesn't lead to you didn't cause. It's not cause and effect. So you work very hard with adult with parents to uncouple that. Correct. I do. And they'll often share in my office or over the phone now with the, the, the mistakes and the issues. And many times I'll say, okay, that good, that was good, that, but that did. In every case, I'll say that did not lead to what your prodigal is doing. And in their letter and communication with the prodigal, I never let them say, well, I did this. And so that, that's, see, that's that control. I want to try to understand. I don't let them say that because I did or said this, that's what's, that's what's caused this in your life. <laughs> no. Most of the prodigals would love to hear that because that's, okay, that gives them an advantage. Well, then it's your fault. I mean, on the surface, they'll say, look, no, I'm doing what I'm doing because I want to do it. But when it starts to break down and it's hurting them, then they'll blame you. So you're not do allowed you, to say. Do you have parents then? D do you ever go this step? Do you have parents who might um, take ownership with the prodigal and say, I mean, they stop short of saying, you know, look, I know I caused your prodigalism, but do you have them uh, openly confess and uh, take ownership of the ways that they have been harmful? Or oh, no, is that oh, not oh, part yeah. of the process? Oh, yeah. No, that's part okay. of it. They're going to be, here, here are the mistakes that I believe I caused. Okay. But we don't add, and that's why you're like this. No, we're just sure. saying, here are mistakes. They can draw that conclusion if they want. You're not doing that. I think this is what's happened, and I'm sorry for it. And then a bit down the road, you're going to, you're going to send that letter to the prodigal without even asking for forgiveness at first. Here, here's, I'm trying to, I'm working through a series of, of steps that I think that are going to be helpful for me and maybe for you. Here's what I've done wrong. And then you ask them for input. I, I'm, I'm trying to be honest here, but there may be things that I missed. Now, if the prodigal interacts with you at all and sends you some things that you think that seem legitimate that you missed, great. You'll add them to your second letter. If it's a pack of lies, and prodigals will lie their heads off very often. Well, you did, I mean, their memory is like, whoa, that didn't happen. I did not abuse you. I did not leave you at the school for 14 hours. I did not, whatever is in their crazy head. You won't add those in. 
You'll say, thanks for your input. And then when you, but that's not, you will say that's simply not true. I'm owning what is true. And you've asked family members and maybe your other siblings, you know, what have I done sort of a thing. Uh, and then, then you're going to send a letter kind of covering those things and then asking them. And here's the key, asking the prodigal to start a process, even in therapy or counseling, which you didn't pay for, to work through these issues in a process of forgiveness. You're not just saying, oh, forgive me, because that, that's not what we want. We want them to work through their dumb issues and get fixed. Boy, I love that. Would you say some more about that? You want them to start? You're inviting the prodigal. You have the parent invite the prodigal into a process of healing. Right. That- this, this is key, because we all know as therapists, this is, we've got taught in psychology school, yeah, this is a process of healing. So even if the, we don't want the immediate, no, I don't forgive you. Or we don't even want, oh, okay, I forgive you. No, but which part is like, oh, I forgive you. I don't care. That We don't get anything out of that. They're messed up. They're in sin. And so we're asking them to work through these issues towards, because for, forgiveness doesn't even happen like that, even if you want right, it. Right. We're going to work through these things. Now, the right therapist, and you've got the right therapist selected, the one you're going to pay for. You don't let your kid find some liberal, non-Christian therapist who will just pander to them. You're only paying for the one you've selected. Uh, and it'll be a private process, but you already know you can trust. They're, they're going to go to that person. The right therapist is smart enough to know it ain't the parent's fault. So even if they come in the door, I'm working on forgiving my parents. Great, Timmy, Susie. It's always Timmy or Susie. Anyway, we'll, we'll do the work here, but it's they know we're leading them to not just forgiving parents, but what else is wrong with you. So the right therapist will, will begin the process with the parents and this and that, but they'll guide the person towards, let's get you out of what you're into, your sinful behavior. That's what it's about. Okay. What do you do with an unsupportive spouse? Yeah, this happens a lot. You know, uh, and I need to know what, what do you mean by that exactly? Because I want to I want to hear some more about that. I define it this way. We, we have a prodigal and he or she is doing whatever and we, we cannot agree on what to do about it. You know, parents have different personalities and different points of view and how they've raised the child. And so now, in, in fact, it's important. It can be critically important to join together as a team to work with that prodigal. That gives you a lot more power and leverage. However, if we don't have that, all right, there's a couple of categories. If we simply disagree on the approach, but both of our approaches are legitimate and not sinful, okay, well, that's one thing. Uh, I recommend reading through my book and and trying to come, because sometimes hearing from a different voice will, uh, you know, somebody with training and education uh, will help you realize maybe some things. What I want them to do is actually read my book and do it my way. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> okay, that's yeah. the ultimate. But if we have a, a spouse that is actually sinning in their response to the prodigal, enabling, uh, providing money, uh, encouraging them in their sin, okay, that's a different matter. Now we have a sinner on our hands. And so now we're going to have to do Matthew 18, 15 through 17 on our spouse. All right, and we're going to go through, before we even deal with the prodigal, we're going to deal with that because the prodigal know, they know about the differences and they're going to gravitate toward the sinning spouse and you're like cut out. So you will confront your spouse uh, individually. You'll one or two witnesses, the Bible says in, in 15 through 17, Matthew 18, you'll, you'll bring to the pastor Yeah, and you will really, you'll do some serious, tough love, maybe even separating from your spouse who's destroying your kid and helping them be destroyed. And then once you've done that, you'll communicate that to the prodigal. And then on your own, you will then go through the steps in my book and, and deal with the prodigal. Dr. Clark, what what is it? Do you more often have uh, a co-parent who is actually not sinning, but just sort of, man, I just, I don't see it the same way you do. Is it, is that a, is it, is that just as common as the sinning uh, other parent? Is it, because I'm imagining two people are seeing this child. What I see is uh, a parent who's just one's more benevolent than the other. One's more, I don't know. What do, what do you, what are the patterns that you see there when you kind of un, unpack it? Yeah, I, I would say probably about 70, 30, 70% being yeah, good people, decent people, simply yeah. seeing it and with their different personalities. Like, like a lot of the ladies I will talk with, or it could be the guy, just much more aggressive as a person, much more confrontational sort of a person. Well, I'm not taking this, and we should, and the other person is just more passive and laid back. See, that works in the marriage. 
very often, but it doesn't work with a prodigal. So those are differences. But see, those can be worked through. Nobody's really sinning. And my job is to help them. I think the book helps. Here, here's a style. I can back that up with scripture. Yeah. You both can kind of get on board. And then your own somebody might be the point person with the kid, but you're gonna you're gonna still be a team. That's not too hard to fix. The okay. other thirty percent, yeah, it's it's a frankly, I hate to say, your dirtball spouse, a narc, uh, you know, narcissist, uh, somebody incredibly selfish, it has his own hit or her his or own sin, and they've turned the kid against you. I mean, these are just bad people. And so you're going to have to deal with them in a very different way. So we have a marital issue that's been there probably for some time. And now we have a prodigal issue on top of it. First, we'll handle the marital issue and actually get you away from that person probably, uh, even if only separation, and then you can deal with the prodigal. And then we give the prodigal two points of view. See, if you stay with that person, it's like the prodigal sees you as being together. And uh, and so you don't get any impact. And your, your influence is muted. But if you are separate now, okay, now we have two paths. We have the godly path, hopefully, and we have the non-Christian, ungodly path, and at least you have a better chance the prodigal can see the difference. In your book, you talk about three prodigal don'ts. Unpack that for us. Number one, and this is always number one, don't obsess. I have, When I deal with parents in the initial stage, they are obsessed with the prodigal. And I think, frankly, all of us would be. It's every waking moment. We live and die with our children. I can't believe what did I do wrong? What can I do now? Reaching out, you know, pers- over pursuing, just letting it take over your whole life. And the marriage, frankly, is going down to nothing. And the feeling is if we, if we can't save this kid, then our marriage is not going to make it. Well, that's not what God wants. That should not have that yeah. kind of an impact. Yeah. We're going to reframe it as, yeah, this is a problem. It's a serious concern. It should not destroy your lives. And so let's stop the obsessing. When was the last time you went out on a date and did not talk about Timmy? Uh, well, they look at me with their mouths open. Right on. That's all we talk about is Timmy. I know that's a bad topic. He's not doing well. Do you have other kids? Well, but yeah. We have life to live. We've got to, we've got to keep living. Let's keep things in perspective is your point. Exactly. Point. And I also sell them the fact, if you don't have social media, get it. Because what we're going to do, and this is like a little secondary thing, but you're going to enjoy your life and you're going to post it on social media so the Chronicle can see your life is moving on. Oh, oh, oh. My dear mother had this great saying before she passed for years, the little dog barks, but the caravan moves on. (laughs) So we're moving on. (laughs) Here's us in Hawaii. Here's us at the Mexican restaurant. Here's us smiling. Life uh, is going on. And the prodigal, because the prodigal loves when you're miserable like he is or she is. We're cutting that off too. It's, a, it's beautiful. Plus, it's good for the people. Do not, in fact, don't tie your happiness as a person or as a couple to anybody else. You, that puts them in control. No, 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 no. You walk with the Lord. You enjoy your life. Now, there's a sadness. Okay, that's not going away, but it can be managed and really be fairly small. Well, you're saying you're making two points there, Dr. Clark. I think number one, you, you have a life to live. Keep this in perspective that, my goodness, if that is all you are seeing and all you're consumed with, you're going to feel miserable. Whereas yeah. if you also keep enjoyment going. And then the second point that seems like you're making is you kind of want to send a message to the prodigal that, you know what, we're, we're, we're keeping this in, pers- we're still going to have a, a life and you could be part of this if you would like to, anyway, some kind of message like that. Oh, correct? Exactly. And we even tie it to the Lord. We, we, you know, here at church and following the Lord, look what happens when you obey God, happiness, peace, Joy. Now, the truth is, the prodigal knows nothing about that. Temporary pleasure and sin, yeah, we'll grant you that, but it's going to destroy you. So you're kind of, without saying a word, you wouldn't post something and say, yeah, stick it to you, prodigal. We're having fun. You're miserable. Of course not. You just show them what you're doing, and and maybe it'll have an impact on them. I'm, maybe I'm missing out here. Yeah, you are. Yeah. So what are the other, That is that one? And we have two more. Uh, two more. Uh, Prodigal, okay, two more yeah, prodigal don't, don'ts. Yeah, you don't, don't obsess. You don't, and you don't enable. Oh, I see this. Oh. There's usually one person in the couple, one, the, the, the mom or the dad, who are just terrible enablers. Even to the point of, 
you know, being sweet and kind to someone who's, who's really treating you badly and just because you're passive and, or money is a big issue. My dad made it very clear to my brother Mark and I in high school, uh, guys, we have raised you to walk with the Lord. If you choose not to do that after high school, we'll get you through high school. I think it's like a law. But anyway, after high school, you, get, <laughs> yeah. you will get literally nothing, not one dime from mom and I if you are walking a path that is really away from the Lord. It was very clear. And that's the, it should be the same thing with the prodigal. We will not finance your sin in any way. You may yeah. get a birthday card, but nothing else. That This topic, boy, this is a huge topic, Dr. Clark, the topic of enabling, because people enable in ways that they don't even see. Well, yeah, I mean, he's out, he or she's out of money. I mean, can't I just give them a little bit of money? Can't I just, um, we want to support them. We want to be, kind, there are kids, anyway, da, 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 da. So to look critically at how might I be enabling a very process that I don't appreciate and don't approve of. So, boy, oh boy, you're talking about looking at people's blind spots, yeah, for sure. And it's, and it's tough love. When I tell them they're enablers, they don't like it. But you know what? I am a doctor, and I have credentials. Anyway, I'm trying to show them. And I know it's hard on them. I say, this is, this is yeah. what's best for your child. This isn't best. You're actually financing that lifestyle. I'm not going to pay rent. I'm not going to pay for food. I, and well, my kid could be on the street. I, I, I'm not harsh, but so be it. We actually yeah. want that prodigal to crash and burn. How many stories in the Bible of people crashing and burning and then them turning to Jesus? None, almost literally until someone's dead, of, of, of loving life and sinning. And that doesn't lead you to the Lord because you're enjoying yourself and Satan's a master at fooling you. So we want that prodigal to crash and burn short of death. But to realize, my life isn't working. Galatians 6 says, if you sow to the Spirit, you reap to the Spirit. If you sow to the flesh, you should reap to the flesh. So you're saying, get out of the way and let them suffer the consequences, the real consequences of their actions. So, yeah, you're, you're really right. All right, what's the third, what's the third um, prodigal don't? You don't tolerate emotional abuse. And many um, prodigals get into emotionally abusing their own parents. Verbally, it's awful. Cussing you out, using the Lord's name in vain. Bla and I would put in this category consistent blaming of you for problems they're having in their life, You know, you know harassing you uh, because of lack of money. I mean, this is just awful. And you'd like to say back, and in some cases I've had parents say back in certain forms, you know, I, you know, you don't, you don't want to add up to me all the money we've spent on. You're asking for $10,000 now for a new car when you got a DUI and trashed your other one sort of thing. I, no, we're not doing that. So that's, and then of course the tirades, yeah, you shut that off. You talk to the hand. I, I am, we're no longer having those discussions, frankly, ever again. You're responsible for your choices and your life. And so we're not going to tolerate. Now, if you can talk with us respectfully, we can even have disagreements. But respectful, okay, that's one thing. We'll do that. There'll be a dialogue. Uh, but what we will not tolerate is to be mistreated like this. No, 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 no. And many parents just take that. And they're thinking is, well, if I take, at least I have a relationship and, and they're talking to me. Well, great, but they're treating you like a dog. That's no relationship. That's feeding the sin. Because if you take it, the message is, I deserve it. I, I think that maybe you're right. Well, no, 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 no. The phone is hung up. I'm hanging up, Timmy. Your voice is going up. You're yelling. I'm not going to have this. That's the way to handle that. Somebody, somebody smarter than me, Dr. Clark, came up with this bumper sticker. We teach people how to treat us. In other words, to your point, too many parents are tolerating too much abuse. And, and they're, they're teaching this adult child yeah, you can go ahead and mistreat me because I'll do it. I'll put up with it. And you're saying, nope, I'm going to teach you how to treat me. And here is the way. And if you can't do it, if you won't do it, we're, we're not going to have a relationship. A, a tough, well tough truth. What do you want to say to folks that are watching this podcast and they're they're thinking, man alive, I'm, uh, uh, I'm who, I mean, 
a lot of folks have a prodigal. They have a, a lot. There's a lot of folks out there that that I, I've run into many, 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 Doctor Clark. So, uh, what's a word of encouragement that you might might say to these parents that have the broken heart uh, and they're they're hoping they're hoping for something different? I say, you know what? Join the club. You are not alone. There are millions. They might not know that because people don't talk about their kids. It's embarrassing and all the rest. You're, you're not alone. Uh, many people are in your situation. It is not anything you did. God loves you. And here's a plan of action. I'm not just going to say, well, get over it or here's some things you can do. It is a it's step by step by step plan. But I've seen God bless that will actually help you with your guilt and give you the best chance to shake your prodigal up. You, and you can have a great life, even if, God forbid, that person, never, that particle never changes. It does not end your life. It, it should not. Excellent. Hey, I don't want to forget one more thing, Dr. Clark. You're on to your next book. You've I, already yeah. written your next book. You're just like a, you're a, people call me a writing machine, but you're, you're ahead of me on the writing machine. You're on the, you're, what's your next book, sir? It is, stop, here's the title, Stop Feeling Guilty for Your Divorce. Beat, beat, beat Satan, beat shame, and enjoy God's uh, freedom and grace. So it's it's even if no matter what happened in your divorce, your yeah. fault or not your fault. I got two tracks in the book. God says I have forgiven you, but I this is it's not. So I, I describe what the Bible teaches about divorce, remarriage, and God's grace and forgiveness. I talk about the psychological healing that simply must take place because God yeah. Satan is using that against you. Then I talk about Satan's lies and how to respond to them. It's a, it's a, I think it's a great package, and it will really help people. God doesn't want you to agonize about your sin. He sent Jesus to die for it, every bit of it. Uh, there are people in the world who don't feel they want you to continue to suffer for your divorce because they're just mean and they're petty. Yeah. And you know yeah. what? They're, they're Pharisees. And so we're screening those people out. And I think it's going to help a lot of people. Love it. Love it. Love it. Well, we'll, we'll have you back uh, a few months down the road and we'll, we'll unpack that because it sounds oh, very, that. very, oh, very important. All right. Well, thank you so much for being here. Uh, Dr. Clark, as always, uh, if any of this resonates with you, please know that we're available to help. You can reach out to us by visiting our website, www.marriagerecoverycenter.com, to learn more about what we do and to find information about what we talk about on this broadcast. If you've enjoyed uh, today's podcast, please give it a five-star rating and be sure to subscribe to our channel to be notified of new episodes. I also want you to encourage you to pick up Dr. Clark's book, Adult Children Who Break Your Heart which you can find on his website, www.davideclarkphd.com. Did I get that right? <laughs> Dr. Clark, and yes. Clark with an E on the end. Clark with an E on the David E. Clark with an E, phd.com. Thanks for tuning in, and we will talk again soon. Take care. God bless.